my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Wendy Burr. I've got to know her uh, a bit during the last few days. It's been fun to have her come not only uh, to visit with all of you as she and her family are making their way back from Cambodia. I believe it's been, what, three and a half months almost? Mm -hmm. She's been living her projects that she will be sharing with you. This is a wonderful opportunity because this is really a great example of social entrepreneurship, doing good in the world, and you can be a social entrepreneur and both do good, and it can be a nonprofit or it can make some money. Both ways are social entrepreneur. And we're going to be really excited to learn a bit about her foundation, uh, Pearls with a Purpose. Uh, she's assisted over 300 women in creating self-sustainability for themselves and their families. She's received uh, awards such as the Humanitarian of the Year, Women Making a Difference, uh, Best of State in her jewelry production. I know you're going to see and hear a little bit about those. That's a lot of what uh, pearls with purpose, but she has other items that she'll be sharing with us. She's been featured in Good Things in Utah. Please join me in welcoming Wendy Bird. Like Brother Tanner said, we've been traveling and I cannot tell you how good America looks after three and a half months in a, a developing country and how good Hawaii looked. Wow, this is like an island paradise. Um, I was last here a little over 25 years ago. My sister attended BYU Hawaii. She's four years older than me. And I came out to spend some time with her and play on the beaches while she attended her classes, which she didn't like. And um, 12 years later, she graduated with a two-year degree in travel and tourism. And uh, that cinched the vote for me to never be able to go to BYU Hawaii as my choice of school from my parents. So I didn't get to come here, but um, it's neat to be back to see um, the beauty that lies here. It's been a fun few days recovering from the jet lag and sleeping at weird hours, but it's really been great. Um, so I run a foundation and a for-profit entity. One is called Pearls with Purpose Foundation, and that's a 501c3. The other is Pearls with Purpose Partners, and that is the vehicle that moves the products that are made. It's also the vehicle that funds the foundation, so the foundation is actually self-reliant in and of itself, and that's a little bit different spin than what most foundations do. Um, but um, I've been doing it since 2002 and I do not have an MBA degree from college. My husband has always said you have the MBA that is the most expensive MBA in history because it's the MBA through experience and real life experiences teach you that an MBA from school can really help you a lot in the business world. So all of you that are here in school, I commend you. Stick with it. It's definitely going to be worth it in the end. Um, so over the last 11 years, we started in the Philippines, and um, we've al also opened up co-ops in Thailand, India, and then we just recently started in Cambodia. And our focus is to teach microenterprise and self-reliance skills to um, underprivileged women. Um, we all actually have worked with men as well, and now in Cambodia we're working with young adults. And um, the foundation focuses on three initiatives. It's the microenterprise component, education for youth, and container shipments which go out twice a year. So those are the three initiatives it supports. And then the business focuses on moving the products made and using the money from the sales of those products to help the foundation move along in its work. Um, it's kind of a unique opportunity to be here. I don't very often get to tell the story of how it all began. And I've been encouraged to tell you guys how it all started 11 years ago. And um, it's, it's actually um, a spiritual story. And so being here at BYU Hawaii, you have a little bit of liberty to be able to talk like that. Um, we, I, I did not go into this to start a foundation. I did not go into this with the attitude that I was going to change the world and help people. I went into this saying, I'm looking for some loose pearls. I want to find some pearls and import them into America and make some jewelry. And that was how small my vision was um, back in 2002. And sent out 
I don't know, dozen or so emails to various countries, made up half the emails and got several responses from companies and organizations saying, yeah, you can buy our pearls and oh yeah, these are good quality pearls. But I got one email that stuck out and it was from a woman in the Philippines and she said, um, if you import pearls from me that are actually in a finished product, you will help people in my country. And I was very enrolled with that idea. I'd been to Mexico a couple times and done some charity work over there. And I liked that idea of being able to help. And I said, oh, tell me more. How would we be able to help? And she said, well, if you put these women to work, they would have a job and they would get money and it would really help them. And um, so I said, okay, here's my address. I live in Utah. Let's pray this relationship works. And she sent me an email back right away that said, you live in Utah and you said you were going to pray. Are you Mormon? Well, that was a red flag to me. Um, I was told Philippines is a Muslim territory and I just just was like, hmm. So I very diplomatically said, yes, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and this business is not associated with that. It's completely separate, and I hope that won't pose any problems for us working together. And she replied with a three-page email, I am a convert of the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm a Mormon. I'm 38 years old. No. I'm 64 years old. I joined the church when I was 38, and here's my story. And boy, was it a story. And so um, God works in mysterious ways, because I'd never been to the Philippines. There was no way I could have met that woman. And, um, and it has just snowballed from that point on. So um, basically, I took the idea of running a business, and I ran with it. And as I was preparing for this talk, I realized I did it the way I got into cycling. But first, I actually want to introduce my family. So these are the three kids that traveled around Asia with me these last three and a half months. They're looking pretty ragged. This is in the Himalayas. And they're here today. And my oldest son is actually here. He's almost 24. And then my husband, Richard, is here. And um, so this is my focus, is my family. I love my family. I'm a mom of five kids. And I love being a mom. But I love cycling. <laughs> I started cycling this last year. Um, I've had this incident happen where I turned 40, and when I turned 40, within the next five years, my body fell apart, and I was told by doctors I had the bones of an 80-year-old. So I've had about 24 surgeries, and I cannot do high-impact sports, and I was encouraged to try cycling. And I did, and I loved it, but I did not research it. And um, when I jumped into biking, I just had a mountain bike. We'd used it in California and gone biking down to the coast, and so we were on rugged terrain. And I just kind of jumped in, and when we moved to Utah, I, and I started biking last year, I just used that same bike. And even though I was on asphalt, I was like, this is great, I'm biking, it was really good. And I learned very quickly that it's not about throwing on a t-shirt and jeans and a pair of shoes and just pedaling on a bike. Um, you actually feel the strain if you're not using the right tool for the right job. So um, this is what I have learned in business as well as in the biking world, that accidents will happen. And boy, did they happen to me. <laughs> I'm not accident prone. But when you buy clip-on shoes for your bike, I became accident prone. So here's a picture of some of the incidents that happened. And along the business world in the last 11 years, I've had a lot of tragedies that have occurred, and I've had a lot of learning curves. So I hope you're not out there looking at me up here thinking, oh, she's got it made. You know, her business is awesome. I, I joke with a lot of people that everybody thinks I have this Porsche business, but the reality is it's a Pinto engine. Because it's hard to run a business. You ran into a lot of complications along the way. So what I've learned through the cycling world that associates with a business is that you definitely need to focus on eight key elements. And those key elements are pedals, the helmet, being prepared for flat repairs, the seat, the shorts and gloves, the bicycle for sure, the headphones, and at the end of the day, the team. So we're going to kind of go over some of those things um, through this presentation today. And then um, at the end of it, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. And I'd actually like to tie into this um, bicycling overview with the business world some of the stories that have happened over the 11 years so you can kind of get a feel for the flow of how the business world does interact on a humanitarian level. 
So my daughter called when she very first saw the slide of my MBA with LBD. She said, what is that? Mom's biking adventures in Lehigh bike ditches? And I was like, thanks, Jerrica. And then my husband said, oh, the little back dress. And I was like, no. LBD stands for learning by doing. And that is how I have found it most successful to run a business. You learn how to run a business by simply doing the work. So my MBA through LBD was first learned with the pedals of the bike. Like I told you, I had a mountain bike. The reason I had a mountain bike is because I loved the freedom of knowing I could drop my feet to the ground at a given notice and stop myself on that bike. I was actually scared to have clip-on pedals because I knew if my feet were locked in and I had to stop suddenly, which those injury pictures show, you can't get your feet out and you're stuck. How many of you in here are cyclists? Has anybody ridden cycling, biking? Okay, we're gonna have some good education here. So when you lock your feet in on these pedals that are pictured on the right side, you're there for life. Like you're there until you unclip. And if you don't unclip quickly, this is how it looks when your foot's in it, then you tip over. <laughs> Because it turns out you can't balance on a bike if your feet aren't on the ground helping you balance. And I learned that several times in a very painful way. Um, so when you're going through life and going through having a business, you need to connect yourself with something that will give you great stamina. And that is what clip-on pedals do. In the business world, if you're not connected to the right source, it's going to be really difficult to have a successful business. The great thing is with your clip-ons is your ability to be one with the bike. You utilize all your muscle groups and you're able to tap into untapped power that you normally wouldn't have. When I was mountain biking and my legs became tired, I simply quit pedaling and put my feet down and rested. When you're clipped in on the clips, you don't have that luxury. You kind of keep going, but because your feet are locked in, your feet kind of get in this rhythm of movement and you're able to go a lot longer and a lot faster. It's really nice. So being able to have efficiency and to stay connected to that untapped power is key to having good success in the business world. Um, as we opened up India, um, we were working with Rising Star Outreach, which I've heard some of you are familiar with. This is out in the leprosy colonies, and we interacted with hundreds of amazing women. These women had never been educated. They've never had the opportunity to go to school. They were in the lowest caste system, which is considered the untouchables. And because of that, their stigma that went with them throughout their entire life was they could not work, they could only bake, and they could not go to school because they couldn't mix with mainstream kids, the public kids. Um, we were able to train 100 women in our very first um, group over there, which was about three years ago, and it was too much for us, and so we dropped down to these 10 women that are pictured, and I'd like you to focus on the woman in the teal sari with the red shirt. Her name is Padma. Padma came to us in that very first group three years ago, and she really struggled with being able to make the jewelry. She was incredibly slow. She couldn't get the patterns right. She was constantly asking the women sitting to her left or to her right to do the project for her. And so as we were dividing the groups and trying to cut down to have smaller, um, smaller groups of women working, we kept eliminating her. And we kept telling her, we're sorry you can't come back. Um, we appreciate you coming to learn, but um, we, we'll have to find something else that you can do. And she kept coming back. Every time we had a session, she was coming back. And um, the fourth time she came back, I was talking to the translator and saying, you know, we really don't have the ability to have her work in our group at this time. And so she started talking with some of the women that Padma was sitting next to. And they said, they said, well, why can't she come? She needs this more than any of us. And they further explained that she lives in this little hut, and I couldn't find the picture of it. But um, she has just a little straw hut. She's got two children. Her husband is an alcoholic and an abuser. And she said, you know, she gets maybe 20 rupees a day. We really need her to work. You know, we have to find a way to help her work. And I said, well, she's constantly not listening. She's always having everybody do her work. And the girl said, oh, well, she's deaf. And I was like, she's deaf? 
And so we learned that we had to sit side by side with her. We had to talk one on one to her face and we had to explain to her what we were doing so that she could read our lips and that she could be really close enough to us to learn how to do what she was doing. And when we were in those big groups of 100 people, she was just lost in the crowd so she was constantly turning to other people for help. Now the really neat thing about Padma is um, on a return trip she's actually made our final group of 10. Um, she's one of the 10 leaders that we are training to be able to manage a group of 10. And when we came back a year ago, um, we were doing interviews which, with each of the 10 women. And each of these interviews took about 10 minutes. And when we were out with Padma, we were talking with her. And it's a little bit harder because of the deafness and the language barrier. And we asked her, you know, so how did you, when were you born deaf? How did you become deaf? And she says, oh, my husband, he beat me so hard on the side of my head that I lost my hearing about four years ago. And that cinched for me how vital this program was for women like that. And so we continued to talk with her. We ended up talking to her for about 45 minutes. It's, it's very difficult to get the um, Indian people to share very private things. They're very private people. Um, a lot of that is based on the fact that they are in a community. And if they lose that community, if they divorce, if they um, are ostracized from their community or talked about badly, um, they lose their whole community and then they're alone. And that's a worse off place to be than to be with an abusive husband. And so um, we finished our interview. It took about 45 minutes and I had already sent the translator in to tell the group to clean up because our transport was going to be coming to take us back. And when we went back in, the other nine women were still sitting down making jewelry. And I said, hey, we got to clean up. The transport's going to be here. We're dependent on this ride. We need to get cleaned up. And they just sat there working, working, working. And I thought, why are they ignoring me? And so I asked the translator, hey, could, could you ask them to please clean up because we've got to leave. And she talked to them for a few minutes and she looked up at me and said, they're making jewelry for Padma. They don't want her to not have pieces that they have done today. So they're doing her work for her. And that is the type of people I have the privilege of working with. They're not in this for themselves. They are in this for the group, for the community. And they made sure that she had 15 pieces completed even though she lost 45 minutes during her interview. And so I love that about what I get to do. I get to interact with really, really amazing individuals. So next thing on the list that we learned we needed right away was a helmet. I call myself a grunge rider. I like to ride a bike without a helmet because I like to feel the wind in my hair. I like to wear a tank top. I like to just go basics and I love it. And then as I was going through all my biking and stuff, this is on the mountain bike before I got the faster bike, I heard this quote. Helmetless, bike, helmetless biking is good for organ recipients. And it got me thinking, <laughs> if I lose my head, <laughs> I lose everything that's packed up in here. I lose all the knowledge, all the stories, all the experiences, and all the information about my business, how I want it to grow, how I want it to succeed, all the people I've interacted with. If my brain's out there on the asphalt, my business is dead and it would come to a grinding halt. So I had to protect my strongest asset and I got a helmet. And sometimes I think I look like a dork, but I've gotten used to it. <laughs> So um, when you're going into biking, you need to be aware, just like in business, of everything you need to protect. There is a lot you need to worry about in the business world and you need to protect your strongest assets. The other thing I learned was that um, there is a lot of comforts you can have in the biking world, just like in the business world. Um, for those of you that don't bike, the seat that you sit on, you can do all kinds of crazy things to try to get your rear end a little bit more comfortable for those long rides. And it turns out none of them work. If you're in the biking world, you probably know that the seat's actually called a saddle. The reason it's called a saddle is because if you have the right seat for your rear end, you could ride that bike for hours and it won't even phase you. But if you have like these wider seats, your legs will go numb. And if you have the kind where your back reclines, you have back problems. And so you need to look at comfort versus practicality. 
um, growing a business is a long ride and we have to look into those things that will help that ride go a little bit smoother. Um, one of the things we discovered is we were trying to source our products, our supplies, the materials we use to make the jewelry, was that it's difficult to find certain sources in certain areas. On my first trip to India, I remember um, Becky Douglas telling me, okay, whatever you think you're going to need in India, bring it with you. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, anything. If you can think of anything that you might possibly need, make sure it's in your suitcase. And I was like, okay, well, what about super glue? Not going to find it in India. Okay, what about this? What about, and I started listing things. She goes, not going to find it in India. And I thought, oh, she was exaggerating. Well, she wasn't. You couldn't find anything that we needed in India. And it caused a huge setback for us as we tried to find sources and things like that. One of the amazing miracles that happened is we ran into Benson Macy. And he's actually a graduate from here at BYU Hawaii. He's one of those who was able to come over from India on a scholarship. And um, he graduated and he moved back to India. He actually could have stayed here with his family, but he chose to move back because he wanted to make a difference within his country. And we were connected with him and he has been such a huge asset to our association. It has been amazing. We've also run into um, suppliers where they've told us when they found out about our cause, oh, well, we'll match your prices, we'll do this, and they've helped us along on our way. So constantly keep looking for that perfect seat, that perfect saddle because the perfect saddle is going to be your fit for a long ride ahead. And if you don't have the perfect fit, it's going to be a pretty uncomfortable ride. So the other person we found was Satish and Bobby and Rakesh. And these individuals, though they're not members of the church, have a huge and firm belief in what's called seva, and that is the opportunity to be able to do good and provide service for others. Um, because you're being guided and directed by a higher power. And so they have loved being involved with us. The other thing that brings good comfort is shorts and gloves. I fought getting biker shorts for an incredibly long time because they have the padded rear. And I was like, I don't really want those. They're going to look funny on me. I'll look like I'm wearing a diaper. Well, it turns out that there's a reason why you have padded shorts. You want be, to be able to have your pad stay where it needs to be. And they do in the shorts. And so you can avoid a lot of unnecessary pain. Um, when we first built our co-op in Manila, Philippines, we built it near a little creek, a river thing that ran behind it. And Lanny, who was our coordinator there and lives there, told me, you know, I don't know if we want to be right here because of this creek. And I said, oh, it'll be nice. You guys can go out to the creek. It'll be good. And she was thinking of something else that I had never even thought to associate with. And that was, if there's typhoons or rains, you have floods. And so sure enough, two years after moving in there, there, it was 2009, Manila was flooded. I don't know if you guys remember that. They had a lot of pictures on YouTube and the internet. And that creek became a nightmare. It actually wiped out our entire co-op and all of our supplies went floating downstream. And we had to rebuild. And so I have learned through the business world, listen to the people that are on the inside in the country. Listen to them. They have experiences. They know. They've been there. They know what their country can do. They know what can happen. And make sure you do those things like, like we should have built in a different location instead of looking at, oh, it's a creek how fun so anyway that's been a really interesting thing for us the other thing that I learned when I was searching out for my bike was to bring a flat tire repair kit on my bike and those of you not in the biking world when you go to buy a bike it is not 50 bucks it is expensive and then they try talking to the shorts 60 bucks and then they try to talk you into a water bottle, 12 bucks. And then they're like, oh, you need the gloves, 60 bucks. Oh, and guess what? Your bike's not $500, it's $1,000 because you need these rims and these tires. It's so expensive. So as I was working with this guy at the bike shop, at the very end, he said, you should have a flat tire repair kit. I'm like, I'm so done. Get me out of your store. And he's like, well, they really come in handy. They just fit under your saddle. You, you really might want this. Nope, I'm good. How much does it cost? Oh, it's $10 for this, $20 for this, $30. It's about 60 bucks. No way, I'm done. 
so I declined. And then when I was out riding my bike, I didn't get a flat, that was good, but I saw a guy who was out riding his bike and he was way off from the road and he was walking it and he had a flat. And as we passed, I was like, oh, that's hard. And he goes, yeah, I wish I had a repair kit. And in that minute I thought, not only does he not have one, but I don't even have one, so I can't even help him. And I realized I should have a repair kit. So I went back to the store and I got one. We have to be prepared for the unexpected. You never know what is going to happen in the business world. You never know what's going to happen in the biking world. You really want to be prepared for the unexpected. I have another friend who rode in the Salt to Saint um, last year. And this is a 480 mile bike ride. It takes a little over 24 hours and he wasn't even on the team. He, there's a team of eight that ride and they do certain stretches along the way. He was actually a backup team player and I made the comment to him, why would you even get involved in this? Do you even think you're going to ride? That seems like a really big waste of 24 hours. You're not even part of the team. You don't even get a t-shirt. T-shirt's the coolest part of bike races. <laughs> and so what good is it going to do to you? And he was just like, ah, I'm just going to try. I just think it would be a good experience. So not eight hours into the race, one of their team riders was riding down the street, and a lady opened her car door, and he rammed into it at about 40 miles an hour. It actually broke his frame on his bike, and it, he flipped over the bike, and he was severely injured. And um, he was out of the race, like boom. And so their backup rider was in the race. And um, he became an official team member and he actually rode several legs of the race for them. So that was great preparedness, both on my friend's part and on the team's part for making sure they had a backup rider. I've often been in attendance at different trainings and functions where I've wondered, why am I here? Why am I in this conference? Why am I attending this social entrepreneurship series lecture class? And I haven't really had the foresight to see that it's going to benefit me sometime down the road. But years later, the tools and learning experiences I gained from being in attendance at that event have been an asset to me in my business. So sometimes it's not going to be an immediate, an immediate realization for why you are where you are. But you will see that sometime down the road, it will be. And so it's good to be prepared for the unexpected. So the most important part of a good cyclist is the bicycle. And like I told you, I was biking in California, mountain biking, dirt roads. It was really easy ride. Moving to Utah, I all of a sudden went on to bike pass. And the mountain bike went 10 miles an hour. I averaged about 14 miles on my rides. But when I came on to the asphalt and was looking into getting a different bike, I wanted to be able to go a lot farther and a lot faster. I discovered that averaging 10 miles an hour and barely being able to complete those 12 to 14 miles was in large part due to exhaustion because I was using the wrong bike. My legs were tired, I was sweaty, I was just exhausted. And so my husband convinced me to visit a bike store and that was where I learned the beauty and definition of the word hybrid. The very first question that the salesperson asked me was, where do you bike? I'm like, ah, oh, I love to bike in the mountains, da, da, da. she's like, no, 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 what kind of road? Oh, it's asphalt. You need a hybrid. And I was like, what's a hybrid? And she says, it's a really sleek bike. You're going to increase your miles per hour and you won't be exhausted. And she was not kidding. I actually increased my miles per hour. I'm going to show you a slide really quick. I'm going to cruise through that one. Let's see if I can get to it. I did a ride and I got up to 58.9 miles per hour. It was awesome. It was coming down a mountain. And it was so great. I'm, a, I'm an adrenaline junkie. But um, anyway, that bike is amazing. So, um, and I've been able to do 72 mile rides and I'm not winded. Like it doesn't even phase me. And so, um, I, yeah, I'm totally sold on investing in the right tools for the right thing. So, definitely look into getting the right tool. The other thing that I learned is that um, you need motivation. How many of you guys have seen these headphones? iPhone 5? Yeah, these are great headphones. I was on a really intense ride one day and I was going up a really steep incline. I couldn't find my headphones before I left and so I grabbed a pair off the floor which turned out to be a cheap $10 pair from one of my kids. The sound was really wimpy 
I didn't have a playlist saved on my phone and so I was listening to Pandora. Pandora typically comes through for me. I love Pandora. I think it's great. But on this day, in this ride, at this particular moment, on this incline, I could not make my feet pedal one more inch. And I really needed some good motivation. And guess what I got? You're in good hands with Allstate. I got the Pandora commercial. And I was like, ah! And, and I could feel my feet just coming to a halt. And I was like, Pandora stinks! Because it just killed my momentum and everything. I almost fell off my bike. I lost all my motivation, lost all my drive. The incline was too steep. And I realized I need something fast paced, something energetic. I don't need Mufasa selling me insurance. And so motivation is important, but not as important as the quality of your motivation. The delivery. The new iPhone 5 earbuds were a perfect example of a beautiful delivery system for me. And I only bike with playlists on my phone now. And last but not least, you want to make sure that you Pick the right motivation. Pick something that really inspires you. Um, when we were in the Philippines, so we do container shipments, and these container shipments go out twice a year. We had shipped about two years earlier boxes to a place called Lagospi City. And um, so two years after that container shipment had gone out, I was in a branch in Lagospi City. It's the first time I'd ever visited there. And this is my daughter, and she had this dress that she wore for a wedding. And on the back of this dress were two buttons that were missing, and on the left side the sash had been ripped out. So she gave it to me and said, Mom, do you think somebody in the Philippines would like this? And I said, yeah, that would be really great. Let's ship that over. They're great sewers. They can, you know, fix it up a little bit, and it'll be a perfect Sunday dress. We went to this branch, and my daughter said to me, Mom, is that Jerrica's dress? Oh no, there's no way that Jerrica's dress two years later is showing up in this town that I've never been to. So we went and talked to the girl and she came and let us take her picture and she said, two years ago these boxes arrived from the States and an angel had put this dress in the box and I got to pick it out and I had my first dress to go to church in. And I just started to cry because I knew that my daughter Jerrica, wanting to help people in the Philippines, would have no idea that that dress would impact a child's life in that way. Another really cool situation occurred on my very first trip to the Philippines in 2006. Um, I was packed and ready to go and leaving to load my stuff to the car to go to the airport. And my neighbor came running over and she had a suit from her um, eight-year-old son. She said, I have this little boy suit. I want you to take this suit. I'm like, Gina, I cannot fit one more thing. She said, no, 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 you can fit it. You can fit it. You're supposed to take this suit. I don't know why. Just take this suit. She rolls it up in a ball and she shoves it in the corner of my duffel bag. And I was just like, okay, okay, got to go. Took off to the airport, landed, got to work, did some stuff stuff, had my bag sitting in this room that I was using, and a woman came over, and she was lamenting to Lanny about the fact that her son was going to be passing the sacrament for the first time in church that Sunday, and she couldn't talk him into passing it because he did not have any clothes to wear. And she said, what should I do? I really want him to go past the sacrament. He won't wear a t-shirt. And I went into my room and I pulled out this suit. And I said, do you think this will fit your son? And sure enough, it did. And this is her son. He's 12 years old. He looks like a six-year-old. He's 12 years old. And this suit fit him. And he wore it that Sunday. And you see that smile on his face. He wore that smile two days straight. He was so thrilled to have his first suit and to be able to pass the sacrament the way he felt it should be passed in his ward. So that was really, really a fun incident. So other people will be inspired to help you along your way. And then the last but not least is your team. You need to have a great team in place. And teams are hard to find. I've been bit in the shorts by several team members, and I've had some really amazing team members. My current team right now started out with um, the girl right sitting down with the polka dotted shirt that's my daughter and she's been my right hand guy for the last five six years she's 22 years old and she's traveled with me and she is amazing and then we've added all these other women to our team and they have just blessed me immensely but the good team also expands into the other countries um, you have to have good team players wherever you're going to be working and I just want to share this story about Lanny Lanny is our coordinator in the Philippines and she's actually opened up every country 
with me. She opened up Thailand, she opened up India, and she just recently did Cambodia. And the type of person that she is, is what I want to share with you. This woman is, um, I think she's about 44 years old. She's got a five-year-old son. She's been married about six or seven years. I think she got married in 2006. And um, she served her mission in the Philippines and she's a convert to the church. And she um, came over to India and her flight was delayed and getting her visa was torturous and we ended up in India um, it was about 2 in the morning and we began our drive and she'd been traveling since about 2 in the afternoon and we began our drive down to the leprosy colony and we were scheduled to start work at 9 a.m. the next morning we arrived at Rising Star to stay in the elephant house about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning we were both exhausted and um, we got a couple hours of sleep and then we headed right out to the the leprosy colony to start working with these women. That was the day when we had over a hundred women show up for training and it was just she and I and ten training kits. That is not a good combination. And so we jumped in and she did not ask questions. She sat down. She was holding hands with these women who were missing fingers. She was interacting, talking, hugging, loving, teaching, training, doing all of those things side by side with me the whole time. This beautiful Filipina girl. And um, we got back to the hostel about 5 o'clock that night after a huge long sweaty day. There's no AC out there. I'll tell you that right now. There is no fans, no electricity. And it is hot and miserable. And we're laying on the beds in the hostel soaking up the AC in the hostel and we're just like oh my gosh we're so exhausted and she sat there really quiet and she looks over at me she says sister Wens when will I get the leprosy and I said what she says well I've been touching these women all day am I gonna get that leprosy and I said Lanny no I said no I said do you really think you can get leprosy and I had not had the minute to tell her you know that it wasn't contagious and she was coming from her perspective of leprosy is contagious I'm gonna to be touching these people's hands I'm gonna get leprosy and she started to cry and she said well I don't care if I get it but I don't want my son to have it and I said Lanny nobody's gonna get leprosy and I said, it's not a contagious disease. The, win the reason the people are missing the limbs of their body is because leprosy is a deadening of the nerve endings. And so they don't know when they get cut or infected and then they have to have the fingers and feet and toes amputated because they don't know the infection is there because they have lost feeling. And so she was sitting there in this colony, hands on, working, and that's just who she is. She unconditionally loves everybody she comes in contact with even at the threat of you know contracting a disease or losing her own life she just unconditionally loves people and I love this woman she has just been amazing to me so find good people on your team make sure they are the salt of the earth so in review be efficient, clip into untapped power. I shared those stories that I shared with you today because the untapped power you can always tap into is your Heavenly Father. He will guide every step that you take in building and creating your vision and your business if you tap into Him. Protect your irreplaceable assets. Make sure that you put protections and safeguards in place. If you need to get a patent, spend the five grand and get the patent. Don't leave it for whatever could happen because the unexpected will happen. Find a good fit for the ride ahead. Make sure you put the things in place that will allow you to have a good, comfortable ride. Avoid unnecessary pain. Get those biker shorts. Definitely protect yourself so that you don't have to go through the pains that other people might have to go through. Be prepared for the unexpected. Definitely know that unexpected things will happen. You're going to have some floods. You're going to have some flat tires. Ride the right bike for the right ride. If you have to build a $10,000 website build the ten thousand dollar website make sure what you're putting your money and time into is going to be what you need at the end of the day then turn into what motivates and inspires you for me I've got a wall at my house and it's covered with the pictures of all the people I've interacted with and that motivates me every day to be able to keep moving forward and then make sure you have the right team because they will make all the difference I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ amen <laughs> So do you guys have any questions? Yeah. 
So what was your model based off of then? So do you have standard, like, do you run it like a normal business, so the work is done basically at like fair trade and stuff like that? So we have two entities. Um, the question is, how do we run this business? It's <laughs> a very good question. Um, we have an entity which is an LLC. It's a for-profit. It actually purchases the products that are made by the women. Then we have the 501c3, which is a nonprofit that does microenterprise training, educational scholarships, and then container shipments, which go out twice a year. And so the money from the sales of the products that they make is funded into the nonprofit to support those initiatives. Does that answer? So is it a percentage of, of income? Or? Correct. It's a percentage of proceeds. So when I was doing it wrong, it was about 85%. Turns out you can't run a business on 15%. So now it's about 32% that goes into the foundation from the business. Is that Sorry? Is that top Correct. Is there any other questions? One of you go. You're like nudging each other. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so with your with management, you like the buildings you have. Uh, how did you choose? I couldn't hardly hear you. I'm sorry. With, with the area and buildings, uh huh. Management that you chose. How did you choose those people? Oh, that's a really good question. How did, how did I choose the people that I worked with in the Philippines? Um, so the Philippines people actually came to me and they were looking for work and that was actually done through email. A lot of it is referral from people that are already in country. Um, being a member of the church gives you a really big advantage. It makes your world incredibly small when you're overseas. It's amazing how many connections you can establish with people because you know somebody who's in the church who lives in that country. And so that's how a lot of ours came to be. When we first started in Philippines, I would say um, 80 to 100 percent were LDS, and now we're at about 30 percent that are LDS, and the rest are just out from the remote villages. Um, and in India, nobody is LDS, but Rising Star is LDS based, and so they're able to connect us with a lot of really good people. So nobody that we work with in uh, right in India is LDS, except Benson Macy, and then Cambodia is LDS. Does that answer? Sorry. Okay. Yes. How long were you there when you set up the co-op? How long did you get to go there and you got set up in your staff? Um, so it's about a month. Um, what I've learned over the years, Philippines kind of self-contained itself in its own model and really ran itself effectively immediately. A lot of that was because they speak English, they were LDS, and they were already making jewelry. And so that was a huge kind of walk-in situation. India was a huge nightmare. <laughs> because none of those things existed. They didn't speak English. They'd never had any formal education. Um, we couldn't find supplies in the country. So I've actually had more trips to India at this point in time than I've had to Philippines. And India's only been going for three years. And so it's been a lot more difficult to, um, to run. That's what I mean for be prepared for the unexpected. Um, we, we actually had to do a lot more time finding sourcing and supplies than we had to on training. How much initial funding did, did you have to go raise money at any point in time? So the initial funding for each project, we typically try to find a sponsor for. The initial funding I had when I started this organization came from my husband and a credit card. Probably don't want to say that, but <laughs> yeah, it, it's yeah, it's expensive. And you know, in my situation, I didn't know what I was doing, and so I just kind of oh, here pay for this, here pay for that. So you kind of. I made it up as I went along. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Stay in business school and don't have to go through those pains and make it up as you go along. But um, since that time, we've been able to find sponsors who have come in or we've been able to use the money from our foundation to fund it. Um, like when we did Thailand, BYU Hawaii, uh, or not BYU Hawaii, BYU Utah had the Wave of Hope Foundation and they had $4,800, which wasn't enough to start in Thailand, but we were able to match it and then find a sponsor and then it all worked. So teamwork really helps. Yes. 
what kind of goals for the next five years? Um, we have some pretty big plans. We've got a pledge program. I actually didn't even get to talk to you about the jewelry. We've got a pledge program, which is a necklace, and it has a single pearl on it, and it's on a chain. And um, you go onto our website, sign our pledge wall, and then it opens up the world of about 200 charms. And the pledge you take at that time is to commit to make a difference in the lives of others, whether near or far. And so then if you go plant a tree somewhere, there's a little tree charm that you can put onto your necklace. If you read a book to a child there's an open book charm you can add it to your necklace and you essentially create a necklace of how you're making a difference in the world today and so moving forward with our pledge program is something we're trying to um, find ambassadors to go do we see ourselves in about five other countries we'd really like to do something in South America and um, Africa and we would also like to start partnering with other nonprofits to create exclusive necklace designs for them so that they can start generating income for themselves through the sale of the jewelry. So we have a lot of plans. Narrowing it down is probably the better question to ask. <laughs> How would I narrow it down? Yeah. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of research do you do to figure out what country you're going to next? Um, for me, personally, I have not done any research to go into another country. People have called me and asked me to come, and I've went. I've gone. Bad English. I, and, and I've gotten there and realized, oh, there's a little bit of problem here. I don't recommend that. Um, it would be good to do some research. I need a team. I need a really good team. I need some interns back in Utah. Because it's weird. Like, when we were called to go to India, the phone call literally came on January 9th and I flew to India on the 19th 10 days later and so and that's kind of how Cambodia went we were in Asia we got the call can you come into Cambodia and it's like oh well we're in Asia okay well we'll hop over and two weeks later we were in Cambodia and so it's kind of interesting and that's where um, the hand of God is literally guiding you along your way and things have just worked out but that's not how it's always going to be um, in future countries I would definitely do some R&D and figure stuff out beforehand Yes. Did following your dream put a strain on your family life? A hundred percent. Did following my dream put a strain on family life? Yes. It's, it's hard. It's hard to be a mom. It's hard to have kids. And it's hard to do a business and be a mom and have kids. Um, I tried to put my family first in all cases, but there definitely is travel and you juggle a lot. That's why I dragged these three kids this last time because I was like, we're going to be gone for three and a half months. You can sit in Utah, watch YouTube, visit Facebook. You can sit in India, watch YouTube, visit Facebook. Take your pick. <laughs> they chose India. They were smart. But um, it, it's hard. But we've had so many great memories. It's, um, I could tell you some really great stories of incidences that have occurred for each of my children that have dramatically changed their life. So it's definitely been worth it. Yes? Um, because you are I got this projector fan. What? Um, yeah, so over the years, I can honestly say I have never drawn a salary from this organization because my husband does have an excellent job. He's been a great provider for their family. So I am not doing this because I have to work. Um, I've had a lot of women who have said, you know, I need to make money. You know, how do I do this and make money? I don't have the answer to that because I don't make money. So. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, get married. Marry a good guy. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you, you can definitely do this and make money. I partnered with, oh, her picture's not up there anymore, but I partnered with this woman, Julie, last year, and that was the best thing I've ever done because um, she's sitting there with the, oh, she'll come up in a second. She's got the short gray hair and uh, with the necklace on the far left. But she's, she's owned 11 uh, blockbuster video stores, sold them all right before Redbox became a big hit. And so she's retired and she knows the business side of life. I don't. I can cheerlead you. I can just, just, yeah, just champion you into my cause, and I can make some amazing jewelry. But I can't run a business. <laughs> and so you bring people in. Where your weaknesses are, if you've read E Myth with Michael Gerber, focus on your strengths. So, yes. Have 
have I found it beneficial to take my business abroad instead of focus in the US? So my business does is abroad. What, so in what sense? So when, where I work in the US, we just run it from a house. We don't have like overhead. And so we have pretty low expenses. And then everything else is abroad. Like all the supplies, everything. The only thing we do in the States is we ship product out of that location. Um, and then we go run conventions. Is that kind of answer or? Our customer base is throughout the world. Yeah, yeah. And they just order online or we go do a convention and um, sell the products at a convention. Are we out of time? One, one more one. question. Okay. Right. Good? Okay, thanks.